the Magic Lantern. G'day and welcome to Forgotten Tasmania. I'm John Stevenson. I'm making an episode about lantern slides that were taken of Kunanyi, Mount Wellington. But you know me, I need to delve into some of this technology. So I had a look at the evolution of the lantern slide, where it came from and where it's going. And I found a really cool story. So I'm gonna share that with you today. The science of photography has had an amazing journey. It's played with different technologies and evolved through experimentation and innovation, especially during the Victorian era, with all their amateur scientists, chemistry sets, Frankenstein and the stuff of old horror movies. I want to start with the evolution of the slide, so I can understand how we got to the glass lantern slides created by Beatty and his contemporaries. A very long time ago, humans had language and they lived in caves and told stories. We know they painted on cave walls. Perhaps this was preceded by shadow puppets. Something like that was probably the birth of the magic lantern, a cave fire and a shadow on the wall. The camera obscura effect, or pinhole camera, viewing an image of the outside world on a wall inside a dark room through a tiny pinhole. That dates back to ancient Egypt. Camera obscura is Latin, so the Romans probably gave it that name, although the first written record is by German astronomer Johannes Kepler in 1604. And Galileo mentioned one in 1612. But Leonardo da Vinci got there before both of them in the late 1400s, with a drawing of what's possibly the first invention to use a camera obscura in reverse to project from inside the camera out onto a screen. All of this was hundreds of years before any kind of film was invented. It had a flame as a light source and the images were painted on glass by hand. The device was called the Magic Lantern. In the 1700s, the French got involved and the Magic Lantern really took off. You could buy slides and charge people to attend. Magic Lanterns gained multiple projectors, introducing effects like dissolve and wipe. The slides were still hand painted, but they added moving parts like levers and clockwork mechanisms to form animated moving pictures. There were slides with oil and water that made the sort of surreal images you might expect from a lava lamp, and even slides with a spirograph pencil mechanism that drew circles in real time on the screen. Lanternists, by dramatising and narrating, invented a new and very popular form of entertainment. This is where it gets really cool. Phantasmagoria was a form of horror theatre that used magic lanterns to project frightening images such as skeletons and ghosts onto screens made of sheets, often using rear projection to keep the lantern out of sight. Handheld projectors were also used, allowing the images to move and change size with multiple projecting devices for quick switching of different images. In many shows, the use of smoke and special effects, spooky set decorations, Total darkness, hypnotic verbal presentation, music and sound effects were also key elements. Some shows added all kinds of sensory stimulation, including smells, shocks, and sometimes fasting and fatigue. Alcohol and drugs were also used to make sure the audience believed what they saw was real. This style of show started under the guise of seances in Germany in the late 18th century, and it was the fully immersive virtual reality of the day. The leading exponent of this type of theatre was Belgian physicist Etienne Gespard Robert, or Robertson as he was known. He took Phantasmagoria so far over the top that even Charles Dickens was impressed. Robertson's signature move was to remain in character at all times, before, during and after the show. Even when being questioned by the police, he still referred to his assistant lanternist as being the resurrected ghost of a dead Russian prince. He never let the authorities see behind the curtain, and he never revealed the secrets of his tricks. It was a complete magic show. The French word phantasmagorie describes it well. The Victorian era in Britain calmed things down a bit. The lantern shows became more informative, educational and formal. 
temperance societies gave lectures on the evils of drink aided by the lantern slide. Church halls, Sunday schools and working men's club all used the lantern to great effect. By the time Beatty became a professional photographer in 1882, there were glass slides made using a photographic process evolved from the French daguerreotype. It was easy to make lots of good quality copies to distribute. You just made a contact print of the glass plate negative, two negatives giving you a positive image that could be projected. The people of the day were used to buying slides to fit in their magic lanterns. Beatty sold slides with his show notes and these were very popular. You still see them for sale in the UK on eBay. Beatty also gave lectures with his slides. It's sort of what I'm doing now with the Beatty collection. There were many other photographers in Tasmania producing glass slides. By 1895, two French brothers, Louis and Auguste Luminaire, had found a way to put a sequence of slides onto a roll of film, and the lantern slide gave birth to le cinématographe, or what we now know as cinema. But the slide wasn't done yet. 35mm slides replaced the larger format glass plates. Then came colour, and slides gave very accurate colour tones in a time when colour photography was far from perfect, and the results from traditional film were often dreadful. In contrast, many amateur photographers were able to buy a roll of slide film, the price included developing. They could take the photos, drop the film off, and a few weeks later receive very good quality colour slides in the mail. It wasn't instant, but it was worth the wait. People gave slideshows of their travel and family photos. It was a good way to share memories and experiences. Kodak's Kodachrome wasn't the only slide film, but it dominated the market and gave us the expression, a Kodak moment. The 35mm slide and its matching carousel projector were a feature in many meeting rooms. By the 1980s you could make 35mm slides using a computer. It was a long, expensive and complex process, but it worked. The overhead projector was popular around that time too. Instead of a slide, it used a sheet of clear film called a foil. You could hand write on the foil or print it with your computer. It was projected onto the wall through a Fresnel lens. The system was big and loud and it died out quickly. Today the word slide has become a way to describe a single page of a PowerPoint presentation. Our modern digital light projectors became available in 1996, around the time of Windows 95 and the rise of Microsoft, who had bought PowerPoint 10 years before from a company called Forethought for 14 million US dollars, the first massive acquisition that Microsoft ever made. PowerPoint went on to become the scourge of the boardroom and we suffered death by PowerPoint. Somehow we had lost the art of the slideshow and we forgot how to tell stories that move people. TED was conceived in 1984 by Harry Marks and Richard Werman as a convergence of technology, entertainment and design. Presentations are given by famous people like Mandelbrot, Bill Gates, Bono, Bill Clinton, and Sir Ken Robinson, just to name a few. It's probably the height of public speaking in the world today. So you can see the humble slide has taken us from caveman to TED Talks, and who knows where it'll take us next. I thought it was important to explore the different types, so we don't confuse the Magic Lantern horror shows of Robertson with the PowerPoint horror shows of today's boardrooms but also to see where the glass lantern slides of Beatty fit into the timeline of this amazing technology. In the next episode, we'll have a look at some lantern slides. They'll be of Kunani Mount Wellington. They come from the collection of Maria Grist. 
She's not only a historian and expert on the mountain, but she has an amazing archive of lantern slides. And the great thing is that they cover the other photographers, so not just John Watt Beatty, but the other photographers that took photos of the mountain. I can't wait to show them to you. Catch you then. Cheers.